Welcome to the Euro Express with me, your host, Kevin Turley. On this show, we climb aboard the Euro Express to visit different European locations where we talk to people living there about their lives and their faith. It's as if we're hurtling through Europe in the dining compartment of the Orient Express with good food and even better conversation. So, all aboard the Euro Express. Today on the Euro Express, we head to Rome where we collect Solène Tadier, the Europe correspondent for the National Catholic Register. And then we head back to her homeland, France, where we meet Dr. Gavin Ashenden, currently resident in Normandy. So, Solène, Gavin, <coughs> welcome to the Euro Express. Thank you. Thank Hello. you for. Thank you. Thank you for coming on board this uh, hurtling train across the continent of Europe. But today we're focusing mainly on La Belle France, which is your homeland, Solène. First of all, I want to ask you, you live in Rome today. You've lived in Rome for some years now. Do you miss France? Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm quite happy with my life in Rome. I've been living here for a decade now, so uh, I'm quite, I feel home in Rome, but I have still all my family in France and so many friends and I'm still following uh, the news in France uh, very jealously, you know, so it's uh, it's still my my homeland and I, of course I care very much about France and uh, I'm very to, I'm very happy to go there as as often as I can. Wonderful. Gavin, Normandy uh, used to be under the British crown many, many years ago, but uh, it's not at the moment. It, does it feel very different from your normal home back in the Welsh borders? I feel very embarrassed to say this because I'm 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 a bit like an adolescent with a crush on a on a film star. I, I'm I'm simply in love with France. I always I always have been. It goes back to uh, the First World War when my father was captured and uh, held a prisoner, and he met a French officer, and they decided the world would be a safer place if their children became friends and spoke each other's languages. So he sent his son to live with his friend. And, and this went down to the grandchildren, of which I was. So uh, I'm a product of that meeting. And they sent me to France when I was about seven. Nobody spoke English. Um, I have somehow uh, immersed myself in the masochism of the, of the misery of all that time. And now I, I, I love it and, uh, and feel very much at home here. France today, um, I mean, there's a lot of people in the British Isles have a romantic vision of France, but uh, today's France may be slightly different from how we imagine it. Um, Selene, how would you describe the current situation in, in terms of the eldest daughter of the church today? Well, <laughs> it would require hours and hours of conversation, but uh, <clears throat> let's say that many people tend to believe that uh, the Church of France uh, has died. But I wouldn't be so pessimistic, you know. Uh, I had a very interesting conversation with the new uh, winner of the Ratzinger, Ratzinger Prize, uh, Jean-Luc Marion, last week, and he told me that, according to him, we haven't quite yet entered a post-Christian era, especially in France. He said, OK, that's true, we have very alarming figures. But at the same time, uh, there are very a lot of reasons to hold right now, you know. Uh, I, I remember a bishop, the current bishop of uh, Nanterre, Monseigneur Rouget, who said uh, once, uh, had this formula that I really liked, that uh, Catholic France is now like a desert with a lot, with plenty of sources. So, you know, there is at the same time a renewal, a monastic renewal uh, in, uh, in the whole France. But it, 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 of course, it's true that there are very strong forces that are going against the, the Catholic Church. Perhaps we are going to discuss more in depth about that. But let's say that, yes, uh, we have very alarming figures. I would mention, uh, you know, the, um, the book by Jérôme Fourquet, who is the, 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 the director of the polling institute, IFOP, and he gave terrifying figures showing that France has reached the end stage of de-Christianization, wow. uh, saying that in the, in the 60s, 35% of the French used to go to mass every Sunday. And now there, there is like uh, the five or 6% today of people going to mass every Sunday. So yes, these figures are very alarming, but at the same time have very interesting phenomenon, very interesting initiatives, uh, like also perhaps the, the the, the monastery of Le Barou, who is becoming extremely famous, it's it's a very yes. important model of the monastic renewal. And I've been reporting on on, on a very interesting um, another uh, initiative of uh, 
uh, a monastic range, a Cistercian uh, grange in the south of France, uh, in the Abbey of uh, Boulor. So you know, th there are very interesting stuff as well, and perhaps we're go we're going to discuss uh, discuss that more in depth. I, I mean, on my many trips to France over, over many decades, I'm always uh, amazed, coming especially from London to, to France, how Catholic France still is. Uh, you know, the reports of the death of Catholic France seem always to be very exaggerated. But the other thing is this, uh, Solène, if anybody knows anything of French history, it's constantly a state, it seems to be a state of revolution and change and then restoration and then revolution and change and then restoration. Would you say that that's a kind of an accurate pro proposal? And if so, is there, is there glimmers of hope for the future of France? We must not forget that France, and we can say that, you know, very sincerely, France was born with the baptism of Clovis, you know. Yes. So in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, four, in 408 after uh, Jesus Christ was born. So it was uh, like more than 1,000 in, in, in 500 years ago. And this is how France was born. And one cannot forget that, even if many people would like to forget about that and to eliminate the Christian roots of France, it is totally impossible. Almost all of our uh, cultural, intellectual, artistic heritage is fully Christian. And there is nothing we can do about that. Even those who would like to eliminate, to purely, you know, uh, delay this, uh, uh, these roots and these signs of our deep uh, Christian culture, they wouldn't be able to do so because yes. almost every monument in France are Catholics. So, uh, and it's something we should, uh, we should bear in mind. Absolutely. Gavin, you are a recent uh, convert to the Catholic faith, converted only last year in 2019. Um, when, when you come to a, a low England was a Catholic country and some would say it still is under the surface, but when you come to a country like France, which is so identified with the faith, do you, as a convert, do you see it with different eyes now than when you, when you did as that young man coming, as a young Anglican coming to France? I think I'd reverse your cause and effect a little bit because it was partly my experience of Catholicism in France that deepened my hunger uh, uh, for for belonging to the true church, the eldest church, daughter of the church. But also it, 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 it clarified some of the confusion that I think uh, English Christians experience. The, the English mm -hmm. experience is a, is a very problematic one because Catholicism disappeared as Catholicism, and it was replaced by a, a state church, which claimed it dressed up like the Catholic Church, but it but it wasn't. And then, and and one of the things being about being an English Christian is this sense of schizophrenia almost that we we live in a land with cathedrals that are over a thousand years old. With or if you like, the the expression is Catholic, but the bureaucrats are Protestant. And this this creates a level of confusion, and I think I think um, disquiet. And when one comes to France, one sees everything fitting in naturally in the right way. So although, as you quite rightly said, the history of France is a very seriously turbulent one in the last 300 years, nonetheless there is a clarity and a purity about it. Uh, and so, as coming from England, that that purity and that clarity is very welcome and really quite inspiring. Are there any little glimpses that you that you that you see in French daily life which just kind of remind you of its deep Catholic roots unexpectedly? Yes, I'd like to take up what what Celine was saying earlier on um, and perhaps expand a little bit. Um, as you as you rightly said, the numbers are bad. So if we have a conversation based on sociology or or politics. Uh, or contemporary culture, then it doesn't look good for Christianity or the Catholic Church, though it has that in common with the Western world. But the quality, there's something about the quality of Christianity within the Catholic French soul mm. that, um, just as Celine was saying, it is this, it's, it's, it is a desert, but there are seeds and there are, she said source, but I think we'd say springs, mm -hmm. uh, ready, ready, ready to go. And I'm I'm always very encouraged when I go to mass in France because it has a vivacity, a confidence, a naturalness, um, which I don't mean to be critical and I'm not, I'm not being partisan, which I don't see in England. In, in England, there's this kind of 
you know, the, 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 the Catholic identity in England is a very complex one uh, for reasons we don't need to discuss now. But in France, it's profoundly rooted and it's ready to go. Mm. And uh, it gives me a great sense of intuitive hope that, that at, at any moment now, uh, some form of renewal can emerge. Selene, so you've already alluded to, to some of the communities that you've, you've written about, new communities or, or mm -hmm. old communities which are sort of reforming and, and finding a new vitality. But I would say that one of the characteristics, certainly of the French Catholic Church in the last 50 years or 60 years, with declining in numbers perhaps, but ever expanding in new movements within France. France seems to have an endless store of new ways of living the gospel, of, of engaging with people. Do you, do you think that's a fair estimate or is that, is that a foreigner's view of France? No, I mean, it's true. There is the community of Emmanuel, the community of Thésée. Yeah. I mean, um, these very important and strong communities were born in France, and it's important. And we, we should, anyway, re recall the fact that there are still today 40, 44 million people uh, that, are, that were baptized in France. So it means like uh, about two in three people in France are baptized, were yes. uh, baptized Catholics. So, you know, it's, it's something important to remember. Of course, yes, we are being de-Christianized, but not totally. You know, we are still a Christian and a Catholic nation, and it is something we should bear in mind as well. So, yes, there are very interesting um, movements and initiatives. As I said, you know, France can be the, the best and the worst uh, source of de-Christianization in Europe, you know, and France inv invented the terror with the French Revolution, and then we had this terrible Third Republic, that was so anti-clerical. And then we had this terrible, uh, let's say, uh, May 68 um, cultural uh, movement that destroyed everything. The, the, the families, uh, family principle, the institution of family um, and, and Catholicism, it has been something terrible. And we see that also in the church right now, you know, with, with this Catholic movements that are trying to uh, to um, perhaps make compromises with the modern world, and you know we see that it failed. It has failed, and the youth today uh, is trying to uh, to go back to the, the the very roots of Christianity. They don't like this modernity. They like very uh, traditional liturgy, and we we can see that young people are attracted to this new movement that seek to go to go back to the very roots of Christianity in France. And that's an interesting observation to make. On this Euro Express, we've, we've stopped at a number of European stops, and it's interesting that every single country says exactly what you've just said, that young people are attracted to full-blooded Catholicism. Mm -hmm. not watered down morals or sloppy liturgy or anything like that. They want the kind of real, uh, full-blooded uh, Catholicism on offer. But um, is the, but if the French Catholic Church, I mean, Gavin was alluding to the fact that there's a complex, uh, the Catholic identity in England is complex, or Britain, we should say. But the, the identity in France, I often think, is, is, is equally complex when you start to drill down, would you say? There, there's quite a sort of dichotomy of views and opinions and quite large blocks. Would, would, is that a fair summation, Salen? Of course. I mean, we, see, we see that all the time. And if you, if you read or hear uh, mainstream media, for instance, they will always attack the Catholic Church. No matter what happens, you know, and we we have we've had we've just had a terrible example of, with the with the assassination of of the poor French man, you know, yes. uh, Samuel Paty, who was beheaded uh, uh, last Friday, you know, October 16, and and and, and the day after, every uh, we could hear on uh, on public radio that the, the the real problem within the society was was, was the Catholic extremism. So you know that people that the, the the that the Catholic Church has always condemned laughter and uh, and sense of humor, and that the very root of our problem right now is Catholicism, and that if we eliminate Catholicism, then Muslim people will understand. So you know, every every time the, the root of the problem is Catholicism. So yes. actually, there is. A, a real, a real fight between two blocks, as you said. People that are still very willing to make Catholicism disappear, but at the same time, it is a proof that Catholicism is still very alive. You know, it's not dead at all. Absolutely. If people want to destroy it. Gavin, if the Catholic Church has outlawed uh, humor and uh, laughter, is that why you converted? 
Well, of course it hasn't. This is one of the, uh, it is a, a, a parody that its enemies um, uh, try and pro project onto it. Um, the, the Catholic Church and the Catholic tradition has been the source, the spring, the roots of the most beautiful uh, elements of European Western culture. All, all the beauty, all the truth, all the love, all the music, all the art has its roots in, right. in Catholic culture. And, um, uh, and actually one of the reasons why people keep on becoming Catholics is because uh, it produces some very beautiful human beings um, yes. and some of the funniest uh, the, and, and in a creative way, anarchic. If you want real anarchy, then, uh, then you come to the Catholic Church because it refuses to accept the cultural norms of, of secularism by constantly asking, asking questions. So in actual fact, I, I think I wanted to add too that this uh, one of the reasons why uh, the 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 younger generation are attracted to full-blooded Catholicism. I think it's because they have been sold by by secular culture uh, an an overemphasis on the importance of the person, which has turned into kind of narcissism. Yes. So the the kind of the intimacy and imminence of the 1960s, all the emphasis on self-expression, uh, has developed into a full-blown narcissism and. One of the great antidotes to that is is transcendence and majesty, uh, and in a proper way, a a hierarchy rooted not in power but in love, and consequently, uh, the Catholic Church, with its enormous repertoire of spirituality, ha always has an antidote for whatever the secular poison of the time is, and the secular poison of today is narcissism. And the Catholic Church has an antidote in, in its in its exquisitely beautiful and profound liturgies, and its roots in a past that takes one out of oneself, yes. where the self has become uh, a, a, a prison and a place of deoxygenization. When when you're in France, uh, presumably you follow the the intellectual debates within the French public square. Um, do you notice uh, a difference in tone or in, in even subject matter or even in the, in the way of engagement uh, compared to, to Britain? Yes, uh, very, very much so. Uh, I mean, Celine is quite right. The fact that the press, uh, the forces of secularism are always attacking the Catholic Church, even when it has nothing to do with it. I mean, the assassination, the dreadful assassination this week was an example of that. Um, is 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 recognition of the latent power that secularism fears that the Catholic Church holds uh, over the over the the minds and the hearts of the population who are largely asleep but but might wake up. Um, in England, the, well, we the, the problem is this. I, I think I think what I would describe as this this problem of schizophrenia that the, the church has two faces, and they they live ill at ease with one another. The um, you know the modified Catholicism of the state church and the um, and and the the, the new dis, newly discovered Catholicism in England, which began with uh, an immigrant population of Irish and, and and Catholics and then later Poles with a tiny minority of landed aristocracy, and is just at the point I think where it is beginning to fuse itself and find a new identity which escapes. Those um, well, uh, well, we'll call them stereotypes. It's not that they weren't true, but nonetheless, it's beginning to escape those stereotypes. And I hope produce a, a a new Catholic identity in England, which is free from some of the historical reflexes of the last two hundred years. Uh, and for that, I think we can look to France for for a, for a, for, a, uh, for what it is to be a Catholic in your in your own country. It's, that there is it's it's a more robust and a, a cleaner sense of the historical roots. So in one sense, I think England English Catholics look to French Catholics for um, uh, for inspiration. So then, what advice would you give this emergent uh, British Catholic identity? Uh, France is being, France is obviously ahead in the vanguard uh, as always in, in so many things, certainly in religious matters. What what lessons uh, would you say? in terms of that newly emerging identity? Well, you know, uh, let's say that it is, it is becoming a European problem because we are witnessing more or less the same, the same issues in Italy as well, in France. Even if in Italy is still a very Catholic country, we see yes. the, the, same, 
the same dynamics eventually, you know, uh, dechristianization, uh, Catholics be being guilty of everything, every trouble. And so we, the, the, the solution for all of our countries is just to be proud of what we are. And that's the key of everything, you know, to, to, to learn people how to be proud again of our culture, of who we are, uh, of what we've been able to build. So, uh, so it has, it, it has, we, we've built it with so many difficulties throughout the ages, uh, throughout the centuries. And we, we should be proud of what we are and, and, and go back to the roots of our beliefs, the roots of our liturgy, uh, the roots of, of, of the beauty of what makes all the beauty of Catholicism. And I believe it is the number one key uh, on our way to a, a very uh, good solution for the future. Yes. I mean, in some ways, what we're also talking about is what the roots of what Europe is. I mean, uh, as, as you both know, uh, the European Union tried to excise any mention of God uh, from from its uh, from its edicts and constitution, etc. And yet, Europe is, as as you were saying, so and France came about through Clovis. And you could you could construct arguments for each part of Europe that that Europe was formed through a Christian identity at some point. Uh, and um, I just wonder. It's interesting that we have a French woman living in Rome, and we have uh, Gavin in in Normandy, and here am I in, in England, and uh, yet there's a sort of um, there's a certain commonality we find no, no matter where we go in Europe. Would you say that 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 Catholicism in Europe is is kind of so embedded into the history and the landscape of Europe that you just can't avoid it? What do you think? I mean, it's the same in Poland, for instance. Poland yeah. was created by uh, by Christianity more yeah. than one uh, more than a thousand years ago. So it's the same, uh, the, the same, you know, uh, dynamic. And this and this is what we witness today. I mean, there are many forces. Even even communism, even very aggressive communism, w w uh, couldn't eradicate ca Christianity from this land. So you know, it's something that is significant, I believe. Gavin, what do you what do you think? Yes, I, I I think that's true. The there is it's a great shame that the European ideal politically has become detached from Catholicism because um, uh, I, I loved what you were saying about confidence. I think that's going to be the key to many things. We should be confident because the original ideal of a Europe of, of a united Europe is a Catholic ideal. I mean, Charlemagne would be someone we could look look back to for inspiration. Uh, it was Catholicism that held Europe and gave it a single. But but multi-layered and rich identity, um, and one of the disadvantages of being a Protestant is that whenever you travel, you're a stranger. You never belong because you belong. You know, you've always lived in this little this little clique. Um, uh, you may have been in control in your own in your own situation, but as soon as you leave it, you're a stranger. And becoming a Catholic was was uh, like entering a wonderful extended family where you belonged wherever you went, all the cathedrals, yeah. all the churches. Yeah. Uh, our, our Lady was there, the Blessed Sacrament was there, the monasteries were there. The, I, I, there was just it was like stepping out of um, out of a kind of twilight zone in, into something real. And I, I I think we should follow this notion of confidence because. Um, all the good things that underlie Western culture are Catholic Christian, have Catholic Christian roots. And the trouble is we have been demoralized by the onslaught of secular vitriol, which has uh, lasted hundreds of years. Of course, it was mainly the French Revolution that did it, but it's no great surprise there should have been the French Revolution should take place in France, because I think France is, is the fulcrum of the spiritual struggle between good and evil. Uh, we should see the French Revolution uh, not simply as a terrible historical accident, but as something almost inevitable, that if if you have this holy country where people have given their lives as martyrs uh, from the beginning, um, you, you would expect some form of metaphysical revulsion to emerge there. And Europe has been dealing with this, this outpouring of metaphysical revulsion for the last two or three hundred years. And the one thing that, that Catholics have got wrong is they've lost confidence. Uh, they, they've mistaken the energy and the muscularity and the aggression of secularism for, uh, for as, as if such things proved it was right. In fact, 
Uh, it is an incoherent, angry, power-fueled, egocentric, destructive philosophy that has never produced anything life-giving. It is always parasitic on Christianity. And I think one of the things I'd like to say to young Christians today and even to old ones is, is to recover the joy and the confidence of being Christian because uh, it is the source of the deepest kinds of humanity and the greatest kinds of political and cultural vision. And, and that's how uh, we should stand up to these enormous uh, attacks that we find ourselves facing in this time of our lives. Do you find that the church in France is much more intellectually rigorous when it comes to this type of debate, this type of engagement? Uh, um, it's hard to say. Um, I, France has the most wonderful um, intellectual history, but but in the last uh, hundred years, it tend, it, it, it's coloured by sort of existentialism. Um, I, 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 I wonder if French, uh, I wonder if French Catholicism has ever really recovered from the revolution. It's, it seems to me that in the last couple of hundred years, it has been rocked backwards, trying to find a foothold to regain its, um, uh, its, its popularity. It almost went underground. There is, of course, an enormous French Catholic culture, but it's been quite quiet politically. Um, and the, the part of the danger is that the, the left have always lured it uh, and teased it by saying, you know, really you are fascists under the skin. And when, if ever you dare to emerge in the political uh, arena, we will call you, you know, we will label you as fascists. And it's been very difficult for the French Christianity to uh, stand up against pugnacious uh, political attacked without joining the other political side. And I don't think it's found the right way of doing that yet. And actually, that's uh, it, this may be the first generation when we can do this, because left and right have suddenly converged. They're, they are both totalitarian. Um, and Christianity is the one uh, humanitarian movement that is free of totalitarianism. And I think if, if, if we can somehow step out into the political arena and say, uh, we are the real humanitarians now um, uh, and, and demand, if you like, uh, rights that truly belong to protect minorities and above all Christians. Um, we might find that we can, we, can, we can have a rational message that non-aligned sympathetic people could understand. And instead of seeing us as closet fascists or, um, or people who believe in superstition, uh, they might suddenly see that actually we have a key to surviving in a highly contested political environment. So then and I would like, like yes, sorry, I wanted to say something. I just wanted just to kind of follow up of what I was saying and uh, what, uh, what what we were all saying because you know many also um, authorities of the church, even politicians and and faithful themselves have the, the desire to be loved by, you know, by ma mainstream media, mainstream people. And so they are ready to sacrifice their beliefs and they are willing to gain uh, people's hearts that were lost a long time ago and that are never going to come back, especially if we want to please them. They, 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 they just don't, don't care about that. And by doing that, we are losing more people that just don't recognize their own church and they just don't understand the message anymore. And with this will to please, to be loved, to be accepted by, by uh, let's say, mainstream media, mainstream uh, um, circles, let's say that, we are ready to, to compromise our very faith, you know, the, the very principles of our faith and the very truths of our faith. And this is something we, we should be very careful about. Can I, uh, at this point, interpose uh, some, obviously the pandemic is, is, is affecting all of Europe and there's been a lot of criticism around that, this, this very issue. Um, Gavin, in terms of uh, the church in, in Britain and the church in France, do you see differences in how they have interacted with the state authorities over the pandemic? I, I like very much the way in which you've taken what Celine has said and, and, and applied it because the COVID pandemic is a very good example of what Salim was describing, uh, the way in which the church is 
seeking public favor, public approbation and affirmation, mm -hmm. saying, well, if we behave really well, perhaps you'll like us, perhaps you'll stop criticizing us and hating us, uh, uh, forgetting that the dislike has spiritual roots, not social, not yes. sociological roots. Uh, and um, in England, it's been very upsetting to see the liturgy being used as a hostage to health and safety culture. I mean, you know, I, I can understand um, confused Anglicans giving way in the way they celebrate the Eucharist because they're not quite sure what they believe. The, I, I'm not being rude. You know, that that, that ambiguity is written in to the uh, to the self-definitions of Anglicanism. But Catholics know exactly what they believe in the Mass. And therefore, it is a supernatural event. And the idea that you can take this, this moment when, um, when the reality of Christ presents himself in such a tactile way and subjugate it to health and safety concerns as if epistemologically they have a greater demand upon your allegiance, is, is a great betrayal. Now, the strange thing is that you, in England, you see priests everywhere wearing latex gloves as if they are, they are dentists or, uh, or midwives. <laughs> um, uh, but in France, it's been really wonderful. Everyone wears a mask. Uh, it's a kind of sign of, of social solidarity. Why not? Um, everyone wears a mask and then they get on with life exactly as they always did. And it applies to cafes and restaurants and it applies to the liturgy. And it's hugely refreshing. And I'm deeply ashamed, really, of English culture, which seems to have done exactly what Celine um, was being rightly critical of, which is you know, begging for some kind of... If we, you know, if we behave, if we adopt your values, if we, uh, if, if we pretend you're right and we're wrong, will you love us a bit more? And the answer is no, you, you, lose, you, you lose the favour of people who no longer think you have any integrity and, and you lose your own self-respect as well. So Len, you, you, I mean, you're, you're touching, both of you, Gavin and Selene, you're both touching on something, though, uh, you said it, Gavin, it's, it's, it's really a spiritual issue, this, this desire to be loved by the world, which, which all Christians have that moment where you either compromise with the world or, or, you, or, or you stay close to the cross. And I guess what we're talking about is that a Christianity without a cross is, is something that a lot of people are, are attracted to or can be seduced by because it's easier. But uh, the, the, very, the very symbol of Christianity is a cross, which means that you're standing aside or apart from the mainstream. So I suppose my question is, was it ever any different in the last 2000 years of Christianity? Has there always been this oscillation between wanting to be wanted, to be liked, be it as a national church during the Reformation or be it during the French Revolution and being part of the new secular regime, or the various attractions today? I mean, or, or, or is, is it just a case of uh, everything changing and nothing changing? Yes, I mean, the church in, 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 in its history has always been in some, in some way within the, the world, but at the same time going against the, the, the flow of the world, you know, fighting the lack of God everywhere. Yes. But Christianity cannot, uh, even a Christian society cannot be completely Christian. There is always a fight to, to, to be fought. And Jesus Christ know that, knew that. That's why he didn't change our society right away uh, into fully Christian society. It, it is something we should fight for all the time. And, in, yes. in, and in, in history, it has always been like that. You know, we are going through a crisis for sure. But crisis is the permanent state of the church. Let's Correct. say that. You know? yes. Because we are all, 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 always putting ourselves into discussion and thinking about themselves, you know, the, the very fact that we are going to confession is that you, we are touched by sin, you know, original sin. And, yes. and so, yes, it's, it is our destiny. We will never be, you know, as, as long as we are on earth and before Christ goes back to uh, on earth, you know, we, we, it, it's going to be our permanent state. We will always be fighting against the lack of God within our societies, and it's it's fair. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a, it's a good way to do things, but we we should just avoid this kind of current situation of of, of uh, complete nihilism, you know, that uh, is. Uh, uh, completely invading all of our societies. It is a very problematic situation. But, we have very terrible situations, you know, in, each, in history. It has but, been also very dangerous. But I'm wondering, is, is today's problem, which, which we've identified this kind of uh, desire to be liked and, 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 and various, I mean, is it, is it, I suppose, is it any worse today in, in 2020, in the 21st century, than it was in the, 
in the 5th century or the 6th century or the 12th century or the 16th century? Well, the principles are the same, as, we, as we've said. The, the principles remain constant. But I, I think that the, the church's uh, ambition to be politically relevant is always inversely proportional to its reliance on the Holy Spirit. Yes. So the more, the more the church understands the power, the presence, the call of the Holy Spirit, the less it is concerned to engage in, in naked political movements. Because the ambition that the church has is the ambition that Jesus has. It's the transformation of the human heart. Now, whilst such transformations will always have political resonances, the heart comes first and the politics follow. If ever you try and organize the human heart uh, by going th by 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 getting to it through a political route, you will fail and you become sub-Christian. So I think at, at any point, you uh, whatever century you you look at, you can if you like take the spiritual temperature of the church and where the church is close to the Holy Spirit, where it is engaging in a springtime of 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 love and obedience. Uh, it will be very casual with its political ambitions because it is exercising a deeper and a longer lasting power. But the problem is that in the last in the last 200 years, particularly as the, as the power of the Enlightenment has grown stronger as a scientific, re uh, but more importantly, the technological revolution has, has grown more powerful. Uh, and as that 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 wretched man Freud grew in influence to spread lies about the human condition, which have proved not to be true, but nonetheless still believed in by our culture, the willingness of Christians to believe in the Holy Spirit and the supernatural has been seriously undermined, and that's what we have to recover. So there's there's no problem, there's no harm in being politically potent, but it's always as uh, as an effect of keeping the integrity. It's never a cause. And, and that's the problem we have at the moment. In the last 50 years in particular, the church has lost confidence in the Holy Spirit and has sought to be politically relevant. Wherever it does that, it will fail and continue to fail until it turns back and, and, and repents, gets on its knees and uh, asks for more of the Holy Spirit. And, and, you know, and that, that's the position where we are at the moment. So Len, you, you're, you're living in Rome, which is the, the center of our church, you know, the Pope and the whole of the Catholic world is, is centered around Rome for, for good or ill. Um, do you, are, is, it, is it a place where you see these signs of hope, where you see the, the workings of the Holy Spirit, uh, more, more so than, than those of us on the periphery? I mean, yes, I would say that uh, just like in the rest of the church, I see the best and the worst part of the church, you know, the original yes. scene is in the very basis of the church. So, you know, I'm seeing everything and I see a lot of sources of hope as well. Of course, I see <clears throat> I see true holiness uh, in people I meet in the Vatican circle. So I see very, very holy people uh, that are going to change things and that make me uh, hope. Again, especially because we have a duty to hope for the church because it, it's a virtue, you know. But uh, but yes, I mean, I, I see many things. When you see the, the news right now surrounding the Vatican, you can see that there are a lot of things going wrong. And uh, of course, corruption and, and opposition, but they have always existed. There is the temptation to believe that nowadays we are going through a terrible crisis and that the church is over, but we should not forget that in the past, uh, the situation has been even worse. And we, we've had terrible popes uh, in, the, you know, back in the 11th century, and we've had, uh, in, in, then in the following centuries, we have great difficulties within the church, and we just survived that. So now, you know, compared with what we've been living in, in the past, I would say that uh, it's yes, it's a crisis, but uh, it's not as severe as it uh, used to be in the past. So, yes, it's a source of hope. And like I said before, we are a, a community, even within the church, there are people that are not fully Christian in the way they behave. But, you know, the mm, Christians must, must be, understand that we'll, we will never be a completely Christian society. Right. And St. Augustine, a city of God, reminds us of, of that. You know, we should reread uh, St. Augustine about that because, you know, we are building our kingdom even on earth you know and we are trying to uh, to, to spread uh, the truth on earth but it will never be completely christian you know it is our duty as, as faithful this is why we believe 
Absolutely. And I think church history is often very comforting because it's such a mess uh, from the start, from the get-go, that uh, n n there's nothing new under the sun. But you touched on, we, we were talking about signs of hope. And um, Gavin, it, sometimes uh, we confuse hope with a kind of bland optimism. I, I mean, what, what's, what, what do you see as the signs of Christian hope today in the church? I remember hearing a story 20 years ago uh, which I think sums it up beautifully. And in, on English television had just televised the Borgias. So going back to what Celine was talking about, there was a very successful, uh, dra dramatically successful televised series which showed the Borgia popes in their full horror. And there was a, a lovely elderly lady who during this period became a Catholic. And she was asked by a journalist, a BBC journalist, who just couldn't believe it. Look, we've, we've all just watched the depravity of the Catholic Church. How can any sane person become a Catholic in the, in the shadow of this television program? And she said, well, I was watching the Borgias, but then I was also watching Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And I thought to myself, what kind of power uh, can, can take a church so corrupted as it was under the Borgias and, and produce Mother Teresa at the end of the process. That she said, there has to be a God. And that was what began me on the path of, 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 of becoming a Catholic. Now, I think that's where the hope is. Um, it's, it's not in any kind of capacity for optimism that we have as part of our general personal psychological disposition. Our hope lies in the effect that Jesus has on people. Our hope lies in the way in which our mother church brings to birth human beings and makes the most wonderfully inspiring people out of them. And the great thing about reading Christian history is that all the way through you come across these astounding people who in, in, in secular terms have nothing. You know, they're not necessarily particularly intelligent or musical or gifted or culturally sophisticated, but they have an inner radiance, above all a love and an understanding of their place in the universe which compared to the confusion and the lostness and the dysfunctionality that most other people outside Christ experience is very attractive. So our hope lies in, in encountering human beings who have been reconfigured by the love of Christ. And then we say, my goodness, that's what we're supposed to be like. Those yes. are the people the church has given birth to. And they, yes. it, it, th that is where our hope lies. Just on that, uh, I mean, we, we are a few a short time after the beatification of Carlo Acutis, who was uh, the more I more I read about this young man, the more incredible uh, his life is. You probably know he was only I think he was 15 uh, when he died. And uh, so he, he, you know, he's within his whole life is within our lives. You know, it's it's a neat. And yet, uh, I think I read somewhere by the age of 12, he was catechizing people and uh, he was giving such great example that people were being converted. I mean, this, this is in our time. This is, this is in the time of this great confusion and, and conflict that we live in. And uh, the Holy Spirit is still raising saints today. I mean, does that, uh, Selene, you, you, you probably, you've seen the coverage certainly in the National mm -hmm. Catholic Register, some amazing shots of, the, of his body is incorrupt and various other things. And I mean, does that, does that lift your heart for the future? Does that give you, is that another sign of hope? Absolutely. I was thrilled uh, that the, the, the enthusiasm that uh, Carlo Acutis was raising uh, all around the world. Mm -hmm. I did an interview, a, a very interesting interview with uh, Father Will Conker, a young missionary that wrote a book about Carlo Acutis. He's uh, both French and American. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book, um, uh, Carlo Acutis, un geek au paradis, uh, uh, a nerd to heaven, basically. And he told me very inter interesting things. The fact that what was going on, you know, a millennial uh, uh, wearing sneakers and, you know, a, 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 a sweater. And he was just explaining the whole world what the church was supposed to be. And, you know, uh, and, and now it was going to be beatified. So he's bringing a holiness into the third millennium. You know, it's, uh, he's a millennium bringing holiness to the third millennium. So it's something very interesting. It's, it's a fascinating phenomenon. And he was such an incredible young man. You know, he was himself a geek, you know, as we say. Yes. But he used to spend less time than, than us on his computer. He was yes. a, a real computer genius, but he totally knew how to manage his time between, 
you know, being a geek, be, uh, spreading the good news through the internet, cre- creating. It, w- it was incredibly young, like at three, 13 years old, was, it was b- building a, a website to spread the good news and incredible miracles that happened around the world. But at the same time, he would save a lot of time to be with his family. He would go to mass every day, and it was the most important things, uh, the, the most important thing for him. So you know, in in, in a way, thanks to him, we know now that uh, uh, we can make the internet out of a place of darkness, a, a place of light. You know, so it's yes. uh, it's something very very inspiring. I mean, the other thing which uh, I'm, I'm still getting to know Carlo Acutis, and uh, I think he, he's going to have a big impact on a lot of people. But his devotion to the Eucharist, especially adoration, and uh, going back to your point, uh, Gavin, around the narcissism, which has completely gripped so many aspects of our society and so many people in it through endless screens and and what have you. I mean, uh, do, I mean, it's interesting. We have a, a computer nerd who's now a saint, and yet his great his great passion, his great his screen was really our the, our blessed Lord in, in in the most holy Eucharist. Uh, do you think there's a there's a hope there in terms of the the revitalization of Eucharistic adoration, which seems to be taking place in England? I'm not so sure about France, but certainly in England there seems to be a revitalization. Well, it's wonderful he was building a website to let people know about the miracles because the real problem is that they don't know. People don't know that the uh, experiences uh, of the miraculous which the Catholic Church has has, has fostered um, are, are, are real. And so, um, it's, uh, yes, again, the, 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 the most, one of the most powerful things we've talked about was confidence and perhaps the second one is holiness. And when you see holiness in a geek, it makes you realize that this false antipathy between technology and the life of the spirit uh, are solved in Christ. You know, once again, we don't have two different ways of being a human being. If you put our Lord first, everything else gets finds its right place. And so, you, you know, the idea you can have a teenage geek in love with Jesus who uses his geekery for the kingdom uh, is, is wonderful. And I'm, I'm, I'm constantly ashamed that... Uh, all the so many of the tales of holiness I see are in are in young people. Saint Therese of Lisieux, yes. Sister Faustina, yes. um, and I think, wow, you know, by the time you were thirty, you were really, you'd really got somewhere. And here have I, I've taken twice, three, four times as long as you. And you know, if I, if I grow old, it's only because the Lord needs to give me more time because I'm going so slowly. But I'm I'm very impressed at the fast runners on the holiness track. And I, I look, I look to them with joy, and I and and they remind me that's what it's about. It's so easy to get bogged down in the politics of the church, the the the, the mechanics of the church, um, the, the 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 darkness of the present times we live in, until you see holiness, and then you say, okay, the God is still at work, the human heart is still vulnerable. Thank you for talking about Saint Augustine, Celine. You know, you you've made me. You've made me for yourself, and until I find myself in you, I'm unhappy. So that's one of the things we need to say to people. Of course, you're unhappy. You haven't met the Lord yet. You, uh, and that's what will change you. The other, I mean, <clears throat> I agree with you that uh, our, our current age seems to be awash with very holy young people from the children of Fatima, uh, Saint uh, Bernadette, and so on. You know, it, it, there is that. But uh, Gavin, you you will know of a, of a recently canonized saint, an Englishman. Who, who lived to be a ripe old age, and uh, John Henry Newman, and uh, you know he 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 is a he is a another example of the the myriad ways in which holiness displays itself. I mean, his life was endlessly in the public sphere. It was uh, complicated on many different levels, and yet it was so beautiful and so intellectual and so on and so forth. I mean, do you see the the the, the holiness and the can- recent canonization, which were only in, uh, in the anniversary uh, just this <clears throat> this month? Mm. Um, do you see signs of hope for England first of all, but also for the wider church in that in that wonderfully holy life? I have a great hope for England. I really do. And 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 you're quite right. Newman is the key to it all, because the, the, I mean, again, the, the, the great things about about the the holy people, if we can call them that, the saints, is um, they they see ahead of the curve. They they can see what matters most. Newman realized uh, historically, really quite quickly, that the, the, the experimental of the Reformation 
was going to end in disaster. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, the Reformation has given, uh, of course it was intended to reform the church, and that is a good thing. But as a movement, it, has, it is the parent of atheism and nihilism. Uh, because because the moment you lose, the moment you leave home, the moment you you, uh, uh, make, you you change your epistemological values to make your own judgment all that matters, you sink further and further into this anti-God uh, movement, which the, which begins with Protestantism and ends up with with anarchy and nihilism. And, and Newman is very exciting because um, he had it all. Uh, he was clever. He was well positioned. He he was uh, 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 hugely important within the educational establishment, and he gave it all up to become obscure and to become faithful. And that didn't make him happy. <laughs> there was there was very little that was happy in human terms about his life. No one liked him for it. No one thanked him. But 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 um, you know once again to use Celine's image in the desert something very beautiful grew, uh, and for many of us Newman is is the example of uh, how to see clearly, how to act clearly, and how to act with integrity in a situation that historically and politically is still working itself out. So yes, he's I, very important for us, I, I, and also a man who, uh, whose life is a complete antidote to what we were describing earlier about wanting to be liked by the by the mainstream, by by the establishment. Totally. Uh, totally. Lord, 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 save us from respectability. Could have been uh, <laughs> Newman's prayer. Um, Selene and uh, Gavin, we're we're finishing up now, and um, I'd just like to thank you first of all for for being on the Euro Express and hurtling across the continent. We we've spent a lot of time in France. Uh, there's a big continent outside that, but I think I think what both of you are are. Uh, expressing very eloquently is how wonderful and how complicated uh, France is uh, and how beautiful it is as the eldest daughter of the church, how much is a gift to all of us, uh, all of us who visit there and go there. So, can, I just, uh, can I just say, can I just add that one of the things that's very much inspired me is that a number of the bishops when they're consecrated have been, are, are interviewed by um, by journalists for for French Catholic uh, media outlets. That's right. And, uh, and I, 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 the moment I saw the new Archbishop of Paris, I fell in love with him. <laughs> I thought <laughs> this this man is wonderful. And and as I've watched some of the interviews with, with the Petit, French Bishop, uh, that's exactly him. Uh, <laughs> I have been so impressed with the quality. Of, of many of the French clergy. Uh, you don't hear people talking about them, but when you meet them face to face and you hear their story, you suddenly realize that, that, that under the surface of the desert sand, there are these wonderful seeds of faithfulness and beauty and holiness. So there is a great, there's a great deal to hope for in France and, and in the church uh, well, at the present moment. Just on the desert sands, uh, Gavin, that's a nice segue through to another, yet another French saint that we are about to have, uh, Charles de Foucault, uh, um, ah, Selene, um, who, whose life, uh, you know, the, the desert sands of uh, the Sahara covered him, and yet, yet his his influence continues throughout the church. Even in the English-speaking world, Charles de Foucault is quite a significant figure. Um, it's, another, it's another great French addition to the church. You must be looking forward to that. Uh. Absolutely. And he also he really helped rethink the way of doing evangeliz evangelization you know, in the modern world. So he, he, he did a very important work with his life, and he's going to be a source of inspiration for years and years and centuries. I, I, I wonder, I mean, I think sometimes that the good Lord has a sense of humor because he's giving us a hermit when a lot of us are locked down. Um, but, but he's also importantly giving us a man whose life was completely centered on the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a man who, who would spend hours upon hours alone in the Saharan desert uh, worshiping our blessed Lord in the sacrament. And you probably know the story that after he was martyred, uh, a French army platoon came across his uh, body and, and, and buried him. And then the French officer uh, was walking through the, the, his little chapel hut that had been uh, ransacked, and he saw a monstrance lying in the sand. And what the French Catholic officer realized was that the sacred species was still in the monstrance. Mm -hmm. And uh, what that officer did was that he lifted the, he put his gloves on, he lifted the monstrance, 
He lined all his platoon up. He mounted his horse and put the monstrance on the saddle and went back to their camp where then he, the priest at the camp, consumed the sacred species. And I like to think that Charles de Foucault, by his life, gave us the first Eucharistic procession through the Sahara. And I that's think correct. In, and I think in our day, that's a wonderful metaphor in, these, in this desert that we find ourselves in so many ways, that we still have the Eucharist and we still have saints. Especially because he was himself deprived of, of the Eucharist for so many years as well. That's right. So he, that's he right. quite understands us. <laughs> that's right. So thank you very much for coming on this journey. It's been wonderful meeting you both in this way and speaking to you uh, across the airwaves. I hope one day sometime in the future we all meet again in much happier times but for now Selene Tadier in Rome thank you very much and Gavin Ashington in Normandy me. thank you very much and goodbye thank you thank you, you. Thank you Kevin God bless